Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining my session about the Java module system. I'm Sharban Yordake. I'm a software engineer at Scoop Software in Germany. And my first encounter with the Java module system was about uh, one year ago, when we at Scoop decided to modularize one of our products. We have an open source framework called Copper, which is a workflow engine that allows you to describe your workflows in pure Java. This framework was Java 8 compatible, and my job was to make it compatible with newer Java releases and to modularize it. At the same time, we wanted that it still work with Java 8, which doesn't know about the Java module system. Because the framework consisted of several libraries, I added a module descriptor to each of these libraries in order to turn them into Java modules. Of course, this was not enough. I also needed to make several changes to our code. But what surprised me was that I also needed a significant amount of work in order to adjust our build process. This is because we used Gradle to build our framework. And at that time, this was March 2018, Gradle had almost no support for the Java module system. That's why I became interested in how to improve things in this area. And for the last year, I contributed to several plugins for the several Gradle plugins for the Java module system. And I also created a few plugins of my own. My goal today is to show you that things change a lot in the last year. And nowadays, build tools such as Gradle and Maven allow you to build your modular code with minimal effort. We will look at typical use cases, at things you usually want to do with your modular code, and I'll show you how to automate these things with Gradle and Maven. But before doing this, let's talk a bit about the Java module system. Since Java 9, the JDK is no longer a monolith. It has been split into several modules. And here you can see the module graph of the Java 9 standard edition platform. At the top of this picture, there are several modules related to the enterprise edition. And because they don't really belong to the standard edition platform, they were marked as deprecated in Java 9. And they were removed in Java 11. Now, having code removed from the JDK means that even if you don't modularize your code, even if you don't make any changes to your software, you may still have problems running it on Java 11 or newer versions. And let's illustrate this with a simple program that prints the XML representation of an object. I have here a product class with ID, name, and price, with accessor methods, getters and setters, and a toString method. Because I want to serialize this class as XML, I also put here the XML root element annotation. The main method creates a new instance of the product class it marshals it and then prints its XML representation to the standard output. For the sake of completeness, we also have a unit test class for our product. There is not much to test on this product class, so I only check if the toString method works as expected. We build everything with Gradle, and this is our Gradle build script. Here I specify only the test dependencies on JUnit. Now, let's try to execute this code first with Java 8. So I'll execute Gradle run. As you can see, the program has printed the XML representation of our product. Now, let's do the same with Java 11. This time it didn't work, and the error message says Java XML bind annotation does not exist. Why? Because this package is part of the Java XML bind module, which has been removed in Java 11. So what can we do in this situation? The code removed from the JDK is still available in public repositories, such as Maven Central or JCenter. And I compiled here a list with the replacements for the removed modules. So in our case, we missed the Java XML bind module. So we'll use 
instead this library, which means that in our Gradle build script, we have to add this line. Let's do this. And now let's try to execute again our code with Java 11. And this time it worked. So we had problem with our code on Java 11 before even starting to modularize it. But we want to modularize our code. So what we need to do is to add a module descriptor to our program. A module descriptor contains metadata, such as the module name, the packages exposed by our module, and the module dependencies. We put all this information in a module info.java file, which gets compiled to a module info class, which is our module descriptor. So the module info Java contains information about the module dependencies, normal or transitive dependencies. It contains information about, about the exported packages and about the packages open for deep reflection to other modules. It also specifies the services used by our module and the services provided by our module and the corresponding implementing class. So the Java module system provides strong encapsulation. A module can specify explicitly which parts of it are visible for other modules and which parts of it should be hidden. But sometimes we want to break this encapsulation. We may want to still have access to the hidden parts of a module. And we can do this because the Java C and Java tools provide us some special command line options. For example, I can ask that a module should export a package that was otherwise hidden. I can specify that a module should require additional modules or that a module should open an additional package for deep reflection. Before Java 9, we needed to put all artifacts in our dependency graph on the, mo on the class path. But now we also have a module path. And this is where our modular code should reside, because modules are resolved from the module path. We can specify the module path using this command line options when we use the Java C or the Java tools. Now, depending on the type of an artifact, if it's modular or non-modular, and on its location, on the class path or on the module path, we have four possible combinations. Before Java 9, we only had this combination, having a non-modular artifact on the class path. Its modular counterpart is having a modular artifact on the module path. But there are two other possible combinations. First, having a modular artifact on the class path. What happens in this situation? Well, all code on the class path is treated as non-modular, and it becomes part of the so-called unnamed module, which exports all code on the class path it reads all other modules, but it is readable only from automatic modules. And what are these automatic modules? They have to do with this combination, having a non-modular artifact on the module path. When we put a non-modular artifact on the module path, it is turned into an automatic module for which a module descriptor is generated on the fly. And this module descriptor requires transitive all other resolved modules, it exports all its packages, and it can read the unnamed module. So automatic modules are some kind of bridge between the modular and the non-modular world, because they are the only modules capable to read code from the class path, from the unnamed module. Let's talk a bit about split packages. A package with the same name is not allowed to appear in two different modules. But we have sometimes this situation where two artifacts contain the same package. How can we deal with this situation? The Java C and Java tools provide us the patch module option. With this option, we say that 
all classes from a list of artifacts should be merged into a given module. For example, with this command, we say that all classes from the JSR 305 jar should be merged in the, into the Java XML WS annotation module. OK, now let's go back to our XML printer program, and let's try to modularize it. This means we have to add a module descriptor to our program. And we saw that we need the Java XML bind module, and we also need to open the package of our program, program to the Java XML bind module. This is necessary because the code in Java XML bind uses reflection in order to analyze the classes in our package and to create the XML representation. Before trying to execute our modularized application, let's make a small addition. I want to print the name of the module containing my XML printer class. Why do I want to do this? Because we saw that when we put modular code on the class path, it is treated as non-modular. It becomes part of the unnamed module. And in such cases, getModule.getName will return null. So this statement allows me to check whether the code has been executed on the class path or on the module path. If this statement prints null, it means that the code is executed as non-modular, is executed on the class path. We do the same with our unit test class in order to see whether the tests have been executed on the class path or on the module path. The first time when I tried to build a modular application, I thought that I don't need to make any changes to my Gradle build script. I thought that uh, Gradle provides native support for the Java module system, but I quickly found out that this is not true. The good news is that since then, a Gradle plugin for the Java module system has been created, and you should use this plugin. But in order to understand what this plugin does for you, it's interesting to see how to build your modular code without it. My intention here is only to show you the steps you need to take, so I will not go into every detail of the code that will appear on the next slides. Now, let's try to execute our modularized application, first without making any changes to our Gradle build script. So I will go to the directory where I already, where I already have my modular application, the application where I put the module descriptor, and let's try to execute here greater run. It didn't work. It says module not found Java XML bind. Why? Because by default, Gradle puts all artifacts and its dependency graph on the class path. So we need to tell Gradle explicitly to put our artifacts on the module path. And that's how we can do it. We say that everything that was previous on the class path should be put on the module path and the class path should be only an empty list of files. So let's copy this code into our Gradle build script. And let's try to execute again our application. And now it worked, but we see here it says running module null, which means that the code has been executed on the class path. So as non-modular code. So we need to tell Gradle how to execute our code on the module path. And again, we say that everything that was previous, previously on the class path should be put on the module path. And we add our module to the list of modules to be resolved. So let's put this in our Gradle build script. And now, if, you, if we execute again greater run, we see that the code has been executed on the module path. We see here the name of our module. 
Now let's try to execute our unit tests. The test the tests were successful, but again they have been executed on the class path. So we need to tell Gradle how to compile and execute our tests on the module path. Here is a bit more complicated because both the unit test class and the class under test are in the same package. So we have to deal with a split package between the module, the main module and the test module. And we need to patch our module. So we say that all classes from the test source set should be merged into our module. Additionally, we have to add the JUnit module to the list of modules to be resolved. And we have to say that our module requires the JUnit pack, uh, the JUnit module. Again, we copy this code into our Gradle build script, but this is not enough. We have configured Gradle to compile our code on the module path, but we also need to tell Gradle how to execute the tests on the module path. We need to do something similarly, but here, additionally, we open the package of our application to JUnit. We need to do this because the code in JUnit uses reflection in order to analyze the test annotations in our code. I'll copy again this code into our Gradle build script. And now if we execute again our tests, we see that they have been executed on the module path. Another thing we, you may want to do is to create a distribution of your application with start scripts. And with Gradle, we can do this using the install this task. And this task, this task has created start scripts for our application in the install directory. Let's execute the start script. And again, the, the program has been executed successfully, but on the class path, which means that we need to also tell Gradle how to adjust the start scripts in order to execute our code on the module path. Here we need to adjust both the bash script and the bat file for Windows. Uh, as I told you, for me, it's only important to show you the, the steps you need to take, so I will not go into de detail. So without further explanations, let's copy this into our Gradle build script. And now let's execute again Gradle install this and start our script. And now we see that it has been executed on the module path. So let's recap. We needed to tell Gradle how to compile and how to execute our code on the module path, how to compile and how to execute the tests on the module path, and how to adjust our star scripts in order to execute the code on the module path. As I told you, there is a plugin that does all these things for you, and this is the Java Modularity Module Plugin. All you need to do is to apply this plugin in your Gradle build script and you're done. So I hope you will appreciate this plugin now that you saw how much work you need to do without it. Let's move further to another use case. Suppose you have a library which is Java 8 compatible, and you want to modularize it. So you need to add a module in for Java to this library, but you still want that this library works with Java 8. The problem here is that you cannot compile the module in for Java file in Java 8 compatibility mode. So what you need to do is 
first to compile all source files except this module in for Java using a value less than or equal 8 for the release option. And then you separately compile the module in for Java using a value greater than or equal 9 for the release option. And when you do this, you also need to put all the classes produced in step one on the module path. And finally, you combine all classes produced in steps one and two into a single jar. And this jar is a modular artifact that is still compatible with Java 8. You can do this with both Maven and Gradle. For Maven, the documentation shows you very nicely what you need to do. There are also POM XMLs as examples, so you need to read the documentation and to adjust your POM XML accordingly. With Gradle, it's much easier because we can use again the Java modularity module plugin, and it offers this mixed Java release method. We only need to call this method with an argument specifying the desired Java release. Now let's, let's discuss an another possible use case. When you have a modularized application, you may want to create a custom runtime image for it. And we can do this using the JLink tool, which has been introduced in Java 9. A custom runtime image is a distribution containing only the modules required by your application. So it is a smaller distribution than one containing all modules in the JDK. You can also create your own Java runtime environment with only the modules you need. But the JLink tool has a limitation. It only works if all artifacts in the dependency graph are modularized. And this is a strong limitation because most of the time your application will have some non-modularized artifacts in its dependency graph. But we can solve this problem. And in order to show you how, let's try to create a custom runtime image for a vertex web application. This application should only serve a page saying hello and a name. And this name is taken from the name parameter of the URL. Or if this parameter is not available, we will use nameless stranger as a default value. Our main method initializes the vertex framework and it deploys the vertical we saw on the previous slide. The modeling for Java for this application only requires the vertex core module and it exports the package of our application. Again, we use Gradle to build our application, and this is the Gradle build script. In the dependency block, we only have the Vertex Core dependency, but Vertex Core had its own dependencies, and the resulting dependency graph has about 20 artifacts, and almost all of these artifacts are non-modularized. So here is our problem. How can we create a custom runtime image for this application, which has lots of non-modular artifacts. We will see in a moment how to do this, but let's also take a look at this line. Well, one of the dependencies of Vertex Core is NetiCommon, and NetiCommon uses the Sun Misc Unsafe class. This class provides low-level mechanisms, and it was designed to be used only by core Java libraries. It is JDK internal API, so it should not be used outside of the JDK, but because it provides critical functionality uh, that is very difficult or even impossible to be implemented otherwise, several libraries and frameworks use this class, and Netty Command is one of them. The problem is that SunMiscan Safe has been removed from the uh, from the Java Standard Edition platform. And it is now part of the JDK unsupported module. And in order to make our code work, 
we need to add this JDK unsupported module to the list of modules to be resolved, and we uh, only uh, we also need to specify that Netty Common requires this JDK unsupported module. Okay, so let's go back to our problem: how to create a custom runtime Im image when we have non-modular dependencies in our dependency graph. The most straightforward method is to just modularize each of our non-modularized artifacts. And luckily, there is a tool that helps us do this. This is the Modetect tool, which generates for us a module descriptor for each non-modularized artifact in the dependency graph, and it adds it to the artifact. Modetect provides plugin for both Maven and Gradle. And let's see how this works first with Maven. So this is the POM XML for our Vertex web application. Here we need to use the Modetect Maven plugin. And then for each non-modular artifact in our dependency graph, we need to configure a module descriptor. Most of the time, we only need to provide a name for this module descriptor because the Modetect tool is able to figure out what to put in the module descriptor. It is able to do this because Modetect uses JDEPS. JDEPS is a tool introduced in JDK 9 which analyzes dependencies, and it can suggest a module descriptor for a given artifact. Most, most of the time, JDEPS will suggest the correct module descriptor, but sometimes it may not be successful, and in such situation, we can explicitly provide the content of our module descriptor, such as here or here. Modetect also allows us to use wildcards when specifying the directives in our module descriptor. For example, here I use wildcards to configure the requires, exports, and uses directives of, this, of the module descriptor of this module. And here I say that this module should export all its packages except those containing impl in their name. With Gradle, we need to make something similar. We use the Moditech Gradle plugin, and then again for each non-modularized artifact, we need to configure the module descriptor. Again, most of the time, we only need to provide a name for the module descriptor, but sometimes if JDEPS is not able to generate the correct module descriptor, we can explicitly provide the content of this module descriptor. Now, the approach taken by Modetect is a very clean one. We just modularize each of our non-modular artifacts. For a complex application, the dependency graph may be quite big. It is not unusual to have about 100 artifacts in our dependency graph. And if most of them are non-modularized, then you need to configure for each of these non-modularized artifacts a module descriptor in your Gradle build script or in your PAM XML. And if you're lazy and if you think this is too much work to do, you can take another approach, the so-called badass approach. In this approach, we combine all non-modular artifacts into a single one, into a so-called merge module. And then we only need to modularize this merge module. And there is a plugin that allows you to do exactly this. This is the badass JLink plugin. And for our Vertex web application, this is how the Gradle build script looks like when using this plugin. The plugin pro provides a JLink block where we can specify options for the JLink tool, and it also allows us to configure the module descriptor of our merged module. Most of the time, this is not necessary because the plugin is able to figure out what to put in this module descriptor. But sometimes it may miss some information. And in these cases, 
we need to provide it explicitly. For example, for our Vertex application, the plugin was not able to detect all services used by this application, so we needed to put them here explicitly. Okay, let's try to create now a custom runtime image for this application. The plugin provides a JLink task, which will create the, the custom runtime image in a directory called image. And it also provides us a task for creating a zip archive of our, of our custom runtime image. This is the JLink zip task. And now, in the build directory, you can see the zip archive of our custom runtime image. It has 32 megabytes. And here, in this image directory, we have the custom runtime image exploded. Let's see what this, what this directory contains. There are several subdirectories. The most interesting are bin and lib. Let's see what's in the bin directory. There are a lot of DLLs because I'm on Windows here, but we also see the Java executable and the start scripts, the bash start script and the start script for Windows. Let's try to execute our application. And now if I open localhost 8080, I see here the hello nameless stranger, and I can also provide a name parameter, for example, jpram, and then it says hello jprime. Okay, now let's see what's in the, in the lib directory. Here we see a big file called modules, which is 25 megabytes big. And this file contains all the classes required by our application, both classes from the JDK and classes specific to our application. We can see what's in this file using the jimage tool. So I'll say jimage list modules. And now we see all the classes in this module. I will stop it now and let's grab for module names. And you can see that this file only contains the Java modules required by our application. Here are not all modules in the JDK, only those required by our application. That's why this custom runtime image is smaller. Now, having a custom runtime image is very useful because we can send uh, an archive of this custom runtime image to one of our customer, and then the customer uh, can use it directly. It's, uh, the customer does not need to install the specific uh, JRE for our application because the JRE is al already contained in this image. But especially for applications with a graphical user interface. We may want to provide a platform-specific application installer for our application. And we can do this with a JPackage tool introduced in JDK 13. This is based on the JPackager tool, which was available in JavaFX, but it was removed in OpenJDK 11. And the BDSJ Link plugin also provides a task for creating such platform specific application. To see how it works, let's try to create a, an application installer for a small JavaFX application that displays a label saying hello J Prime. 
The module descriptor of our application requires the Java FX controls module, and we need to open our package to the Java FX graphics module. This is necessary because the launch method uses reflection in order to create an instance of the application class. This is the Gradle, uh, the Gradle script for our application, and here are two interesting things. First, we use the JavaFX plugin, which takes care of providing the JavaFX libraries for our specific platform. And in this JavaFX block, we can specify the list of JavaFX modules required by our application. Then we have the possibility to send some additional options to the JPackage tool. For our simple JavaFX application, this is not needed. We don't need any additional uh, options, but I put here this, this block only to show you how it is possible. For, for example, here we pass some additional options for the Windows operating system. I say that I want a per user installation and that the user should be able to choose the installation directory. But once again, we don't need this code. You can throw it away and the plugin will still generate the correct application installer. Let's see how it works. We need to execute the J package task. When we created a, a custom runtime image with JLink, we have the possibility to create also custom runtime images for different platforms. For example, I'm here, I'm a Windows, but I can use JLink to create a custom runtime image for Linux or for Mac. All I need to do is to provide the location of a JDK distribution for the specific platform. And the BEDES JLink plugin has support for this option. You can very easily create custom runtime images for other platforms. With JPackage, this is not possible. If I want to create an application installer for Linux, I need to execute JPackage on Linux. If I want it for Mac, I need to execute JPackage on Mac. Here I am on Windows, so JPackage will generate an application installer for Windows. Okay, we have this application installer in the jpackage directory. This is it, and let's start it. Now it started to install our application. It's down, and we can try to execute it. And as expected, it says, hello, J Prime. Okay, the last thing I want to show you is how to create a custom runtime image for a non-modular application. Sometimes you cannot modularize your application, or it is too difficult, or Maybe you just don't want to modularize it, but you still want to use JLink in order to create a custom runtime image. What you need to do in this case is to create a custom runtime environment using only the JDK modules required by your application, and then you copy all the classes and dependencies of your application along with the start scripts into the directory of this Java runtime environment. Again, we have a Gradle plugin that allows us to do this, and this is the BEDES runtime plugin. We apply the plugin, and then in the runtime block, we have the possibility to configure additional options for JLink, and we can also provide the list of modules required by our application. Most of the time, it's not necessary to, specific, uh, to specificate this list of modules because the plugin can figure out by itself which modules are needed. In the case of our Vertex web application, we had this problem with the SunMisk unsafe class and we needed the JDK unsupported module. 
the plugin is not able to detect that we need this module, so that's why for this application we need to explicitly specify which modules are needed. Okay, so we saw how to build, test, run, and create star scripts for modular applications. We also see how to create a modular artifact that is still compatible with Java 8 or older versions. We saw how to create a custom runtime image of a modular application, even if this application has non-modular artifacts. And we can do this either with Modetect, which modularizes each of our non-modular artifacts, or with the Badass J-Link plugin, which combines all the non-modular artifacts into a single module, and it modularizes. Then we saw how to create platform-specific application installer with the JPackage tool, and again using the Badass J-Link plugin, and how to create custom runtime images also for non-modular applications. And we also had a look at this JavaFX Gradle plugin, which takes care of providing the JavaFX libraries for your specific platform. If you use Maven, you should use the Moditect tool. It is a powerful tool. Powerful tool. It uh, provides you uh, many many options to configure your modular code and to do things, also some other things which we didn't discuss in this talk. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show you today. If you have questions. Okay, if there are no questions, then thank you. <laughs>